Coffee used to only be a quarter. These days, three bucks is not unusual. But what about in a future where it's harder to find? It could be 10 or 20, or maybe you can't get it at all. It's kind of ironic to look at the success of all of these cafes. All of that is built on the success of a plant. That's Hannah Neuschwander, and she's the communications director for a group called World Coffee Research. And they're giving a pretty dire forecast. Demand for coffee is expected to double by the year 2050. And if nothing is done, the amount of suitable land to grow coffee will decline by half. You do the math. So, a few specifics on the kind of coffee we're talking about. We drink two different species of coffee. Robusta is what you tend to find in lower quality mass market coffees. But the main kind of coffee we drink is a different story. Its parent plants should not have been able to breed. But they did, and Arabica was born. It doesn't taste like one thing, it tastes like a hundred things. Peach and lemon and raspberry and strawberry and blackberry. If Arabica died out, we'd still have Robusta. But its taste has been described as drinking burnt car tires. And with a changing climate, there's not many steps between now and that possible future. As temperatures rise, it chases coffee up the mountain, is what we say. So the amount of farmable land to grow Arabica is shrinking. And with the higher temperatures have come pests and disease. Coffee leaf miner, nematode, the coffee berry borer. And one of the biggest, coffee leaf rust. In Central America, they call it La Roya. You could look out over a coffee field, and it looked like someone had gone around and stuck a bunch of sticks in the ground. So how do you fight that sort of thing? Well. There's this kind of arms race that happens between the diseases and the pests and the crop that you're trying to grow. So the coffee industry came together and formed World Coffee Research to try and stay a few steps ahead. So if we can develop a new coffee variety that is more tolerant to drought or more tolerant of high temperatures, it's going to make a pretty big difference. Most of what's sold in your grocery store has been developed this way for useful traits like to be bigger or tastier. Scientists like to call this work genetic improvement. But compared to other crops, coffee has lagged behind. Really the simplest reason is this. Coffee is grown in poor countries and it is consumed in rich countries. Just to give you a concrete example, in watermelon breeding, they have produced over 3,000 distinct varieties of watermelon. In coffee, there are 36. So how do you go about improving a crop? You make new varieties. All breeding is, is people helping plants have sex, right? So it's just matchmaking, basically. You take some pollen from the flower of one. That's the mother plant. And literally, like with a paintbrush, you can paint the pollen onto the father plant, and you have just helped a plant have sex. Then you watch how those plants grow up and see which ones have the traits you want. This whole process usually takes about 25 years. So to speed it up, Hannah's team is looking at some pretty futuristic sounding technology. Molecular breeding sounds like it happens in a lab, but mostly it doesn't. So does that make it a GMO? No, absolutely not. You'd start by sequencing coffee's genome to find out which genes give the traits you want. Then you could use that database to analyze baby plants. They actually use a hole puncher and take a little leaf sample out. Rather than waiting for the plant to grow up, you have a very quick way of screening to say, yep, that's a good candidate, nope, that's a bad one, yep, that's a good one, nope, that's a bad one. This cuts down the 25-year breeding process by about half. And Hannah says getting these new varieties out to farmers could be key to keeping Arabica growing. The farmer's plant is the most important asset that he has. Everything depends on the plant. If we don't help coffee farmers make the adaptations they need to make, there's not going to be a lot of coffee in the future. So this is what climate change could look like for a lot of us. Not hurricanes, not fires or flood. Instead, those things we take for granted becoming more expensive and harder to find. And then one day, they might vanish entirely. Humans love coffee. That has proven itself over quite a few hundred years now. We will probably do quite a lot to keep it going. The question is, will we do it before it's too late?